Welcome to Utopian Horizons. Hello and welcome to episode 18 of Utopian Horizons, a podcast where I look at a different utopia, dystopia, utopian thinker or movement in each episode to explore different visions of the future, look at ideas that have changed or could change the way we live, what these utopian visions tell us about ourselves and the critical and inspirational power of utopia. In the last episode I did, I said that the following one was going to be about strange days. Obviously, I lied because it's not. Basically, I have kind of forgot that I was arranging to do this episode and it just ended up getting slotted in before the strange days one. But the interview for the strange days episode is recorded, so that would definitely be coming. That is definitely the next episode. Um, but anyway, on to this one. This episode isn't so much about a specific utopia or dystopia or movement as I would normally do in, in previous episodes. Basically this was just uh, inspired by, a, I read an article on The Guardian by a guy called Mark O'Connell called Why Silicon Valley Billionaires Are Prepping for the Apocalypse in New Zealand. And it was full of the of the language of utopia and dystopia and touched on a lot of the stuff that I've been covering on the podcast. Obviously, Silicon Valley's been coming up a lot if you've been listening to, to recent episodes. And I just thought it'd be really interesting to talk to Mark about the kind of apocalyptic dystopian or, or utopian vision of these Silicon Valley billionaires. But anyway, we'll get onto that in the in the conversation that we have. Before I go into the interview, I'm just going to quickly go for a couple of stuff I normally leave to the end, because you, you probably just turn off after the interview and I start begging for iTunes reviews and stuff, but I'm going to slot it in before, and now you're going to have to listen to it. So yeah, if you have got a moment to give me a review on iTunes, that would be very helpful. Um, it would just help to raise the profile of the podcast. I don't know exactly how their algorithms work, but I do know that the more reviews you have, the more visibility you have on iTunes. So yeah, if you could take a moment to do that, that would be great. Also, I have a Patreon at patreon.com slash Utopian Horizons. That is there to help me cover the, the hosting costs of this podcast. And uh, hopefully if that Patreon can grow, then that will make it easier for me to, to keep doing this and doing it more often. I like to try and get episodes out as um, quickly as I can, but you know, sometimes work and other stuff gets in the way. As I've previously explained on the podcast, I... I do work as a freelancer and I often have to end up using the time I should be spending working doing the podcast. So yeah, if, if I could get some more money on Patreon, that would be justify that to myself and I could spend some more time on the podcast. So yeah, it's at patreon.com slash utopian risers if you can afford to and have the desire to sling a couple of quid my way for the work I do on this podcast. So as I mentioned, my guest on this episode is Mark O'Connell. He's a, a writer who you know, recently wrote a book called To Be a Machine, which is about um, kind of transhumanist attempts to escape death through through various means, uploading brains and um, cryogenics and all that sort of stuff. We do touch on um, the book actually in the interview, so there's, there's some stuff on that. also has links to Silicon Valley, as um, seemingly everything I do does at the moment. Yes, the main topic of the conversation is this kind of um, this kind of bizarre trend for um, Silicon Valley billionaires to buy land, build bunkers, and so forth in New Zealand as a kind of insurance policy uh, against the apocalypse, which they seem to feel may or may not be coming. And it's a it's a strange kind of apocalyptic vision that blends a kind of utopian and dystopian vision in in various ways, and and is founded on. Um, some kind of uh, utopian thinking I think but it's better if I don't go on about too much and you can just hear us talking about that I hope I've said everything I meant to say here I'm very tired so I may have forgotten something but I, I think probably not so without further ado on to my conversation with Mark joining me now is writer and author of the book to be a machine Mark O'Connell thank you very much for joining me Mark thanks a lot for having me so um, Mark wrote an article recently for The Guardian, which um, very much piqued my interest, called Why Silicon Valley Billionaires Are Prepping for the Apocalypse in New Zealand. And at, being as that was full of stuff about utopia and dystopia, and Silicon Valley has been a... And, and it's kind of ideologies has been a subject that I've been unwittingly kind of touching on repeatedly as I go through. I decided it'd be really good to speak to Mark about that. So... Um, 
before we get on to talk about the New Zealand thing, I just thought it might be helpful to talk about Peter Thiel because he's kind of a key figure in this, or at least emblematic in in some way of, of the kind of things that, that you're talking about. So could you explain a bit about who he is for anyone who might know, even, even those who might be somewhat familiar with him may not know about his his kind of ideology and, and so forth. So could you talk a bit about, about who he is? Yeah, I mean, the sort of simple version of describing Teal would be to say that he is one of the kind of major venture capitalists in Silicon Valley. He founded PayPal in the sort of late 1990s with Elon Musk was another person who kind of came into that, mm. uh, the early days of that company. But he's since gone on to find a bunch of sort of targeted venture capital companies that invest in the technology space. He's also, he also started uh, Palantir, which is a huge kind of private sort of surveillance company mm. that works with uh, US intelligence and uh, various other kind of uh, nefarious kind of groups. Um, he's also like, he sort of became, I mean, I wrote about him quite a lot in my book to be a machine because mm-hmm. he is someone who has invested quite heavily in the technologies and sort of speculative technologies around the idea of like radical life extension. And um, he's obsessed with extending human lifespans like particularly his own i think and so he is someone who yeah i i sort of i guess set up as as something of an emblematic figure in the book but he's also like more recently become fairly notorious as i mean he's notorious for so many things these days it's hard to kind of curl them all but (laughs) so he was like the the one figure of, of any real note in silicon valley who came out explicitly in support of trump um, during mm. the presidential campaign. Uh, and he's, you know, since been kind of uh, mooted as a possible, you know, Supreme Court justice and all these kinds of crazy things. Oh, wow. um, so, I mean, that that seems like a bit of a long shot. Uh, he's also notorious for having bankrupted Gawker via the instrument of Hulk Hogan. Yeah. Gawker outed him as gay many years ago, and he kind of uh, served his a revenge cold by funding Hulk Hogan's libel lawsuit against mm. Hulk, which caused the whole thing to collapse. And yeah, he's also, I guess, more recently again, known for having uh, essentially bought New Zealand citizenship and bought a huge amount of land in New Zealand, uh, apparently as a kind of a hedge against the collapse of civilization in the rest of the world, um, which is mm. why I kind of went down there and... and investigated that but so yeah i mean you can probably tell from what i've been saying so far that teal in a way that i'm not entirely sure how it happened but he's become this sort of uh like i say in the article like he's a white whale kind of figure for me in my work he's someone who like represents something far larger than himself i think he like he represents to me and to quite a lot of people actually a kind of a new and particularly rapacious form of techno capitalism Mm. this guy he's he's publicly said right that he is i don't know if he said he's, he's against it but he's kind of suggested that democracy might not be compatible with with freedom yeah that's right i mean that's one of his more notorious statements that sort of haunts him to this day i mean he he doesn't do a lot of sort of public engagement stuff but whenever he does he tends to say something like massively controversial and reveals or sort of hints at the extremity of his political views but one of the things that i i kind of take him up on that i suppose in in the piece that i wrote for the guardian Mm. and i I write a lot about this book called the sovereign individual which is this i mean very extreme kind of libertarian manifesto that was written in the late 1990s and i think it published in 1997 as the work Mm. of this guy james dale davidson who uh, is kind of a an investment analyst who specializes in kind of uh, advising people on how to profit from sort of <laughs> catastrophic situations, basically. And it's co-written by uh, Lord William rees Mogg, who's Jacob rees Mogg's dad um, and the former editor of The Times. But so Teal is a huge uh, fan of this book and has been kind of a public booster of it. Um, and this book essentially kind of um, predicts the widespread collapse of the democratic nation state internationally <laughs> due to like various factors one of which i mean they're quite sort of um, prescient in predicting you know in, in the mid to late 90s the rise of like online economies and the kind of rise of cryptocurrencies and um, bitcoin as as a kind of an emerging phenomenon but as something that causes the like increasing de- destabilization of the nation state they write a lot about the kind of consequent rise of what they call a cognitive elite of like sovereign individuals sort of essentially 
extremely wealthy, couldn't kind of highly clued in tech savvy individuals who were able to kind of leverage the destabilization of nation states to kind of set up their own kind of uh, bespoke corporate utopias, which is something that Teal has often been kind of associated with in the past, this kind of like post post democracy kind of energy that comes out of Silicon Valley with things like the seasteading movement, which I'm sure you've kind of looked at in your utopian kind of investigations. Yeah, it got it came up. Uh, I did an episode on uh, uh, Bioshock Infinite, the video game, and um, that came up as a kind of almost uh, real life manifestation of, of that idea. That's a huge blind spot for me because I'm sort of starting to realize that because I don't play video games, that there are all these kind of like, I'm, I'm obsessed with like apocalyptic scenarios. Yeah. And I'm, like this book at the moment is about apocalyptic anxieties, but I'm starting to realize that maybe I need to like roll up my sleeves and buy a PlayStation and start like video gaming. Yeah, the, yeah the video games are, I think, particularly obsessed with, with the apocalypse. So yeah, there's plenty of stuff there. Like yeah, Bioshock stuff, Fallout series. Yeah, lots, lots more. Um, on that book, though, so this is um, this is that it has that kind of classic libertarian thing where the, the nation state is basically evil, right? And taxes stealing, and then that sort of thing. Is that yeah? That's it. I mean, it's basically they explicitly describe democratic nation states as essentially protection rackets. Mm. They sort of describe them in a way that you would basically have trouble distinguishing between a liberal democracy and a sort of a thuggish gang that just extorts money from honest businessmen. And so, yeah, like the state is an evil that needs to be evaded. And the way that that can be done in this view is through cryptocurrencies, essentially. It's quite startling how detailed and sort of in some ways quite accurate their prediction of the rise of cryptocurrencies is. And so like this book is like, it was fairly obscure. I mean, I came across it through the two guys that I write about in the article, the two um, guys in Auckland. Uh, one of them is the artist Simon Denny and the other guy's a, a critic, Anthony Burt, who essentially they read my book to be a machine when they were starting to talk about this project that they were involved in and they got in touch with me and we started to talk about their work and they were kind of obsessed with this book um mm -hmm. the sovereign individual so i came at it through them but it's become like it seems to be a book that you know it's not like you know it's not coming out in penguin classics anytime yeah. soon, but it is like it's having a bit of a moment in in silicon valley you know with people like teal mark andreessen is quite is quite a vocal kind of um booster of the book it seems a bit like Anne Rand like coming a second time because I feel like Anne Rand was had very similar ideas and was kind of picked up by uh, obviously this isn't not a Silicon Valley thing but you know very wealthy people as a way to kind of justify their their vast wealth and and their ideology of what they wanted to do and it's perhaps it shares a kind of intellectual history with Rand. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, they don't talk about Rand much in the book, if at all, actually, if I remember correctly. But yeah, I mean, it feels in some ways like a nonfiction kind of uh, extrapolation of the sorts of ideas that she's floating in, in her book, which I have to say I haven't read. No, me neither. So this, this kind of um, just like libertarian Silicon Valley thing, which is kind of embodied in people like Peter Thiel and, and Elon Musk and, and so on. I mean, do, do you have any particular um, idea like why that seems to have taken hold in, in Silicon Valley in particular? Like, is there anything about that place, um, that culture that makes these ideas kind of fertile? Um, you know, first our ground for, for this kind of stuff. Do you mean libertarianism particularly? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think like libertarianism is always going to be attractive to people who consider themselves unusually smart and who have made a lot of money, mm. particularly through businesses that seem to disrupt bureaucracies and those kinds of things. I think like, I mean, this might be slightly glib, but I feel like so the, the Ayn Rand version of libertarianism, certainly that I imagine is something that would be quite appealing to kind of grown up nerds who like had mm. a hard time in school and they sort of have a chip on their shoulders as being like smarter than everyone else. And here comes Ayn Rand with this sort of apparently quite worked out intellectual theory as to why you in fact are better than other people. And you mm. deserve to kind of like launch yourself like a rocket ship into the stratosphere of like society or literally into outer space and Elon Musk's kind of vision or whatever. I don't know. That's a very sort of 
like hauntalistic and no i don't quite like that it's like it's almost like oh right ideologies kind of picked up by those well i don't know i don't want to say like well dickheads obviously but like yeah i'm frustrated those kind of frustrated people where it seems like that more sort of libertarian brand is particularly good for those who've had success oh right it's kind of often um associated with that kind of frustrated um you know white man who likes who feels like he's being held down which it's more difficult to apply if you're a very wealthy venture capitalist. Although I think those like the the sort of people who feed off that Ayn Rand ideology and energy, part of it is that it allows them to feel like if not actually victims, then people who are constantly evading some form of potential oppression. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. They th- they think of themselves as kind of like freedom fighters. I think I was going to ask you about. I don't know if you have any ideas on this a bit as well, but um. In terms of just Silicon Valley, like there seems to be like these different perceptions of what it is. So we've obviously got this thing that we've just talked about, like this libertarian thing, but you've also got this idea that it's a place of like hipster, liberal, kind of vague progressiveness, which is either passed if you're one of those alt right people, you pass that as kind of a hypersensitive offence culture you know like virtue signaling and all that and if you're on the left you might think of it as a kind of mm, liberal centrism that hides kind of exploitative nature of like startup culture and some kind of less obvious uh, racisms and stuff like that there's, there's a different very different perceptions of silicon valley and that kind of thing is different for the libertarian strain are these do these things all exist in Silicon Valley? Are they are they anyway like fake and constructed and imagined? And or are there any connections between these different uh, ideas of Silicon Valley? Yeah, well, like I should sort of preface this by saying that I am speaking only as an outsider to Silicon Valley. Sure, um, and so my that's sometimes useful, though, I think. But maybe, yeah, but like so, like I'm not even a particularly privileged outsider, if you know what I mean. So my my view on the place as a cultural phenomenon is quite slanted. I mean, my kind of my interaction with Silicon Valley was very much I was looking when I was writing my book, certainly I was looking to extract certain very extreme ideas from that culture and try and sort of make them uh, reflect back on the, on the mainstream of that culture in a way that I hope wasn't distorting, but definitely it was a particular angle. And so the other thing to say about Silicon Valley is that there's sort of like, there's no there there, right? Like so like when people talk about Silicon Valley, it's often difficult to identify what it is they're actually talking about. Like even geographically, like, you know, you don't really go to Silicon Valley. Like, I, you know, it's like, it's it's hard to get there in, in an interesting kind of way. Like, so obviously San Francisco these days is kind of Silicon Valley is what people are talking about when they talk about Silicon Valley. But so I think... Like, yes, I, I would say the the first of those two things, like I would say broadly Silicon Valley is kind of like liberal in that in that sort of like, you know, vaguely right on kind of <clears throat> way that is not necessarily anathema. I'm having trouble getting at this in a way that like curls the two things together. But I would say like there are definitely extreme elements within silicon valley there are i mean the sort of like the neo reaction movement certainly i think is inextricable from the culture of silicon valley and there is this tendency within the tech world generally to like view politics as a sort of a hackable system as a kind of as a a problem that might have technological solutions and to see the sort of coder mentality or ethos as the thing that is most usefully applied to like larger political systems. It's a kind of a delusion, I think, that is particular to the tech world, to Silicon Valley. I would want to be careful about speaking about the tech world as though like extremism was somehow inherent within it. I don't think that's necessarily the case. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there is there is something about Silicon Valley's sense of itself as this kind of not transgressive is not the right word, but this like sort of a culture that is on the vanguard of yeah. um, the economy and as a kind of a force that is both creative and destructive that I think leads to ideas like the neo-reaction thing that I write about a little bit in that Guardian piece. And 
yeah, it's complicated, I suppose, is what I'm getting yeah. at. Definitely, I definitely think there's something in that um, idea of like all these, the Silicon Valley, regardless of the kind of political allegiance, tending to think of politics in terms of like technical solutions or like formulas to be like they, they i don't think any of these people sort of believe in ideology if you know what i mean yeah like, they think ideology is not like is a thing for other people but like they don't think of themselves as ideological they think of they think of themselves as like solving a mathematical formula or something um anyway let's get let's get back on to the the thing you wrote an article about because that's uh, i really want to talk about that because it's very interesting so essentially your article is about people like peter Thiel who are making um New Zealand into a bolt hole for themselves. So why New Zealand and why do these people think they need a bolt hole? What are they escaping from? Yeah, well, so that, that, that's sort of the set of questions that I went to New Zealand to try and find answers for. And I'm not sure whether the, the article actually generates any concrete answers. Like what was interesting to me about the reaction to the piece, which was quite overwhelming, people reacted to it as though I were imparting the information that not only are these people out there buying land as a hedge against the collapse of civilization, but also the apocalypse is imminent. I think that was kind of the, right. the reaction that, that I tended to see. Like this thing is a symbol of, you know, a portent of, of end times in a way, um, which was not necessarily what I thought I had when I was writing the piece. So I went out there like, yeah, to try and answer those questions, like why New Zealand? In Like in some ways, that's a really easy question to answer. Like geographically, New Zealand is really fucking far away from everywhere else. Mm-hmm. And yet at the same time, it's a place that you can get to within like whatever, you, you know, you can get an overnight flight from California. So it's reachable. So it is that sort of like sweet spot between remoteness and accessibility. Um, it's also mm-hmm. an incredibly beautiful place, which is the first thing you realize when you get there. That sort of complicates everything. You get to New Zealand and you see these places where these billionaires are buying property and you kind of go, oh, well, I get it. You know, if I was really wealthy, I'd probably buy a nice little spread for myself in New Zealand. So that's like some of the reasons. Obviously, the book that I talked about, The Sovereign Individual, what was interesting about that to me was that aside from all the kind of extremely kind of radical libertarian manifesto aspects of there are some practical kind of elements to the book where they suggest things that you should do if you want to be part of this like cognitive elite in the future and one of the things they suggest is that buying land in new zealand would be a good place to sort of a good place to set yourself Mm -hmm. up for this kind of future um for a lot of those reasons like it's it's relatively safe from kind of extreme weather events it's uh, like they have earthquakes, obviously, but that's something that I guess if you were kind of well inland and you're like away from sort of built up areas is not a huge issue. Mm. Um, I think from, from Teal's point of view, and Teal is the person obviously that I focus on most in the piece, it's difficult. I mean, so there's so much projection when it comes to Teal because he doesn't really talk about this stuff. It's all kind of projection and deduction in a way. But he's obsessed with Lord of the Rings. Yeah. That cannot be discounted in any of this, actually. In New Zealand's kind of position as this uh, utopian space within the current sort of apocalyptic environment, particularly as it as it relates to Silicon Valley, can't be separated from Tolkien, basically. Yeah, I was going to ask you that, whether it's like really, because this idea of like, oh, you know, it's a practical thing. This is the... There's good reasons to be here, but it seems like in, in some ways it's like a also partly just a yeah the utopian projection on Teal's part because the guy's obsessed with that book. That's that I mean book. the first thing to be said about Teal really is that like almost all of his companies are named after elements of the Lord of the Rings books, and I'm by no means like I'm kind of an ignoramus when it comes to both sci-fi and fantasy, but like all of his companies are references to Tolkien in one way or another, like Palantir, which I mentioned, which is the big kind of surveillance mm. operation. The, the Pal- I don't know if you know this, but the Palantir are, I think, seeing stones, like these stones that are used to like watch over people that are used by, who's the like the big bad guy in Lord of the Rings? Uh, Sauron? Sauron? Yeah. yeah. I'm not really <laughs> into that either. So. Yeah. Um, so Lord of the Rings like is a huge element of all of this. And so when, like when I went down there and traveled down to the, south island from auckland to go and like actually visit teal's like apocalypse property for want of a better term uh, i went with anthony burt who's the the art critic who i mentioned and uh anthony is like in a weird sort of way obsessed with Tolkien. i mean he despises peter jackson for various 
complicated <laughs> reasons. Uh, one of which is that I didn't know this until I went down there, but New Zealand's labor laws were changed in the early 2000s specifically so that the Hobbit movies could be made in New Zealand so that they could um, hire like actors and, and crews uh, without making them employees or whatever. So New Zealand's labor laws have been like, materially damaged by, by people. <sighs> the Lord of but so when I was traveling around there with Anthony, he had right about it a little bit in the piece, but he had this weird kind of like inability to see his own country, like, cause he's from the North Island, which is geographically very different. The South Island, you go down there and suddenly you're in like middle earth, you know, mm-hmm. he was <laughs> in a strange sort of way, unable to really appreciate the beauty of, of his own country because he kept seeing fucking Lord of the Rings, you know? And that was kind of weird to me that like Tolkien had been superimposed over this country in a way that sort of reflected what's going on with like Teal and the Silicon Valley people in a way as well. Mm. I just want to emphasize as well, like we're not kind of exaggerating calling it a, a bolt hole. Like you've, you've said that there was, um, there's people, there was some Bitcoin billionaires who literally were constructing a bunker there. There was, I was surprised how like brazen they are about this. Like you, you said um, Sam Altman, who I'm not familiar with, but apparently Silicon Valley guy said to the New Yorker that he and Till had an arrangement where if there was some kind of giant apocalyptic collapse, like a virus outbreak or a rogue AI taking over the world or nuclear war or something, then they were going to get on a private jet and go to Till's property in New Zealand. So you're yeah, not exaggerating when I say that they're making this into a, a place to escape. But like, there's, do you think these people don't sort of see the irony of like, if there is going to be some kind of, you know, super powerful AI taking over the world or, or something like that, do people like Elon Musk and Peter Thiel are going to be at the centre of, of these kind of things? No, and Thiel as well, as you said, explicitly backing Trump, who, of course, is the relations he's kind of um, had with North Korea. If you're worried about nuclear war, then that's kind of you know, pushing closer to anything than, than anything else. So, I mean, do you think these people don't sort of realise the the irony of their they're like building a place to escape from the problems that they're creating? Yeah, well, I I think this is where it gets really interesting and also kind of disappears into sort of potential conspiracy theory stuff, which I'm okay with. I'm fine with that. I'm like, I'm as influenced by Pynchon as anyone else. But like, I think what's happening actually is that it's not so much that, so say Teal, to take our central example here, it's not as though he's purely or like only afraid of the apocalypse in the way that like the sort of doomsday preppers are. I think he's playing a much more complicated game. And what he's doing, I think, is he actively wants to destabilize democracy in order to create this post-nation state libertarian sort of dispensation that the sovereign individual kind of delineates. Again, like this is can only ever be speculation, but I think what we think of as the apocalypse is like the sort of collapse of civilization or whatever is something that might not be such a terrible thing for him because something like from his point of view, better might arise out of that. Mm. As you said at the very beginning, from his point of view, he sees democracy as something that is no longer compatible with freedom. And like when libertarians talk about freedom, they talk about the freedom of the individual, the wealthy individual to accumulate as much money as he or she could ever possibly want to without Mm. the tyranny of taxation or of any kind of like responsibility or obligation towards society, which they see as purely kind of abstract anyway. And uh, like, I think inherently a form of like oppression of the individual. Mm. I think that's what we're talking about when we talk about Teal's apocalyptic sort of leanings yeah there's something really fascinating about the the character of that as well because like so a question that gets asked on this podcast is like utopia for who but this is a kind of more like dystopia for who like it's um you have this thing in the, in the article you talk about the, the book of an individual and it's kind of ide- ideology being it's kind of predicting this this dystopia of your your darkest imaginings but it's a, a, like a new utopian dawn for, for somebody else. So like you, usually when thinking about utopian stuff, utopia tends to always have something problematic that you can uncover in it. So normally when you're analysing a utopia, you're kind of uncovering the dystopian dimensions. But this is like the reverse. There's something strange about this thing, this kind of 
it's like an apocalyptic utopianism where, um, like you said, they they almost uh, anticipating the the apocalypse gladly. They see like this um, this collapse as a new utopian moment. Yeah, so it's a dystopian vision, but it will bring a, like a utopian future for them. If you see what I mean, it's like really strange about that mix of like apocalypse and and utopia. Yeah, I think so. Like it's difficult to say what it is they are imagining in terms of like the broader picture of the world itself. I think what what they imagine for the future is that like the vast majority, and maybe they're right about this, like this certainly seems to be the way that like capitalism is heading as far as I can see, like that the vast majority of people are basically screwed. Mm. Uh, Like the way that the economy is heading, you know, and like taking in things like climate change and, you know, the threat of political instability, It's sort of like, well, at this point, maybe we should just feather our own nests and sort of hunker down and try and continue making money out of the technologies that we've built. And um, yeah, I I like, but I I think there probably is some kind of utopian impulse in there. Like, I go back again to the um, to the idea of seasteading, which is really like, on one level, completely absurd and like basically kind of idiotic, but on another (laughs) level. It's fascinating because you're basically, you're talking about people who are like, they're looking at civilization and seeing the cracks in it. And Mm -hmm. instead of saying like, how do we fix this? How do we contribute to some kind of communal betterment? Mm -hmm. It's like, well, to hell with all of you people, we're going to build a new country out in the middle of the ocean in international waters and like have it just be tech innovators. And it's going to be amazing, but you can't. Mm -hmm. That in itself is a deeply apocalyptic kind of notion. I think, you know, when people begin to think like that, that in itself, you're you're already seeing civilization in some way has to already be collapsing for that to be like a a, a viable notion, you know? Yeah, it's like, it feels like it's sort of the kind of ultimate frontier for disaster capitalism. Yeah, like you say, they they either, either don't care or just kind of accept as inevitability that everything's screwed and think well at least this is like a new frontier for profit and and power and as you said Teal seems to basically want his own country I suppose so yeah I guess he sees this as like this is an opportunity for to get that power yeah I think that was like the one thing that really freaked out a lot of New Zealanders about my article was that that quote where an acquaintance of Teal says that he has been known to speak about like you know pricing up what what it would cost to buy his own country and that in connection with his slightly creepy interest in in new zealand as this like vast empty place that might be a good place to be in the collapse of civilization or whatever that's something that kind of new zealanders found i think rightly a little bit upsetting yeah i I wanted to ask you about actually but just just quickly i think something that's in important about that is you say it's in the article as well like if something you know if we have some kind of climate disaster or you know something of that nature then these are the people that are going to be able to afford to not have it affect them basically and obviously that's something that we should be aware of is very problematic disaster is going to be spread as equitably as current power relations basically and i find it very frustrating when people think that the likes of elon musk are kind of going to save us from you know another kind of tech silicon valley people are going to find the solutions to save us in the future and we should remember that like these people were preparing for disaster and they will be insulated from it so yeah yeah I, I, I mean i find that i mean i would love to know who are the people who think who really like really believe that elon musk is capable of saving us from catastrophe. Like, I think there's something really fascinating about this idea that we, quote unquote, are going to perpetuate the survival of the species by, like, by virtue of Elon Musk, Musk's incredible cleverness and like virtuousness. Like, it just seems completely yeah. absurd to me. Also, like at a, at another slightly philosophical level. Like I was in Boston last week and like I did a talk at the Boston Museum of Science and there was a lot of sort of tech people there, like MIT type people and stuff. And one of the people who came up to talk to me afterwards was talking about the whole Mars colonization thing and Musk's like SpaceX yeah. project. And he was sort of saying, well, you know, obviously we need to like survive, like, you know, the, the, the sun is going to 
is going to implode or whatever in like whatever it is a billion years time and you know we need to ensure the survival of humanity and that's not going to be possible here so we need to get to some other like exoplanet or whatever and at that point i was sort of like well actually like do we i'm kind of okay i'm kind of like i'm basically fine with like humanity not existing after the sun projects like that is not like a priority for me in any way maybe i'm just like selfish that i don't care about a hundred generations from now or whatever but also like I, it was it was interesting it was just like a complete breakdown of like the, there was it was like there was no shared sense of what was important between us yeah but yeah i just I, ultimately i i don't like most people i suspect don't buy elon musk's product which which is the notion of no. elon musk as the savior of humanity yeah sure just reminded me of something actually weirdly so I, I hadn't been conscious of it recently but according to like stats for this podcast this podcast is most popular in san francisco so i'm, <laughs> I'm constantly banging on about how bad silicon valley is so that's weird great city though and there are some very nice people who who uh, listen to this podcast who said that they live in San Francisco or in in tech. So I don't want to make out like everyone in Silicon Valley. Is Use this uh, to point out that I feel like I'm partly a San Franciscan. My grandmother is from San Francisco. I have family over there who I love deeply. I love San Francisco. It's great. Just going back to this thing you mentioned about New Zealand as a blank slate, I thought it was interesting because I think you particularly you mentioned a, a Maori academic there, but. Something that's there a lot in in history of utopian thought. So, for example, there's a book I'm, I'm reading at the moment for a future episode where they find this like undiscovered, uninhabited paradise in Africa, and you know it's not insignificant that it's like these colonial spaces that are often like empty. And I you know, just wondered you could talk a bit about that. This this kind of problems of this idea is New Zealanders or you know utopias in general as being like a blank slate. Yeah, well, I think that's like something that a lot of New Zealanders, at least on the left, and particularly like Maori intellectuals are very aware of is the way in which like that colonial notion of, you know, spaces of colonial expansion generally, but particularly New Zealand was seen as this like terra nullis, this sort of utopian empty space where political experiments could be carried out. And like, that's one of the things I didn't know about New Zealand before I went there was that like it has often historically been seen as the site of like as a kind of a, a political petri dish really um like as the first country in the world to have full democracy actually the first country in the world in which women had the vote so but i think like from a colonial perspective that is something that like yeah quite a lot of the people who i talked to and obviously my like in my reporting i was quite bias towards speaking to mostly left-wing people because that was what I was interested in getting the temperature of like the reaction to to Teal and his relationship to to New Zealand but yeah like I think this notion of like New Zealand as a kind of a, a blank canvas is something that has come up again with this kind of vision of it as this kind of like safe space against the backdrop of some future apocalypse wherein like some version of civilization could be re- could be you know rebuilt or at least survived and i think there is definitely an element of that in how these people think about new zealand i, think. <laughs> I just wanted if i could talk a bit about your book to to be a machine um which i sort of found out about having after reading your article which sounded very interesting because obviously that's got some well my impression is that seems to have a significant silicon valley connection as well excuse me could you just tell tell us a bit about um the book what it's about yeah, well, it's basically about um, this movement known as transhumanism, which is essentially the conviction that we should use technology to kind of push out the boundaries of the human condition. And that basically the sort of evolutionary destiny of the human species is to merge with AI and to become really something other than the kind of biological creatures that we are, to become like human machine hybrids. And so, yeah, I mean, it like it's not a book about Silicon Valley as such. It's a, like, this is a global movement, but it definitely, there is something about Silicon Valley that has allowed transhumanism to take root in the soil there particularly strongly, I think. So when I was writing the book, I initially, when I started writing it, I kind of thought, well, this is going to be interesting because I'll get to go all over the world. And, you know, to the extent that my budget allowed it, you know, I, I thought that I would be going all over the place. But basically I spent most of my time in and around Northern California because I think, this 
idea of like technology as this like inherently transformative thing that's going to allow us to solve any and all problems attendant on being human is something that I think in a way is perfectly in sympathy with Silicon Valley's sense of itself as the font of solutions for all kinds of human problems, basically. And this sort of techno utopian notion of like technology as the thing that will allow us to transcend all of our problems. So what what kinds of things are these people exploring or trying to do to like Probably escape? the kind of things that you're very familiar with from having read like Philip K. Dick and maybe Arthur C. Clarke and people like that. Like things like mind uploading. Mm. I spent time with people who like consider themselves to be cyborgs who like design and build implantable technologies that they kind of implant under their own skin to allow them mm. to have in theory superhuman capabilities like in practice very mildly superhuman capabilities like the ability to sort of open doors by waving their hands and take mm. biometric measurements and like sense magnetic north and all those kinds of things prionics is another aspect of it although highly controversial as a science or pseudoscience mm. i suppose like yeah brain, brain uploading is the big one and immortality they're very invested in the idea of like living forever through technology mm. i think it's not, not a coincidence i don't think that people are like Teal are interested in this again like the, these people who who are preparing to escape the apocalypse also because he uh, he said in, in the article right, that he's he's expressed it in I, I don't know there's some guy who takes blood has like i don't know i guess pays young people to take their bloods and teal was um interested in, in that yeah i don't know whether he has ever actually partaken in this like life extension therapy it's i think <clears throat> parabiosis is the term but uh, he definitely spoke about it in this way that was like, oh, th this is an interesting thing that people are doing. And I'm very interested in this at the moment as an investor and as a person. And so, yeah, basically it's like, it's vampirism, essentially it's extending your own life through taking in the blood of younger, healthier people, which is like almost too perfect as a metaphor yeah. for kind of capitalism that that Teal yeah, represents. Sure. Okay, just uh, just one, one final question. Um, obviously... I think we, we, it's pretty uncontroversial to say we think this thing of the rich being able to escape the apocalypse at the expense of the rest of us is pretty obviously vulgar. But what about this this thing you've, you've written about into be a machine, like in general, this idea of escaping death? Like, do you see that as a utopian goal, like, you know, escaping this, the pain or trauma of death or whatever? Do you think that is a utopian thing or something that's worth chasing? Well, like maybe it goes back to your initial point about how every utopia is, or every idea of utopia is always a potential dystopia and maybe like inherently dystopian from a particular mm. point of view. The book kind of arises out of like my own anxiety about mortality. And like it starts with me becoming a parent for the first time and getting kind of obsessed with the fragility of the human condition in this kind of like existential way i suppose and becoming obsessed then with transhumanism as this thing as this like movement that seems to offer a way out of that through technology but so like it starts with a kind of a sympathy like i definitely agree with the mm. critique of human existence which is that it really sucks that we all have to die and that everyone we know will eventually die and we'll have to watch our loved ones pass away and all that kind of stuff like that is i agree that is unacceptable mm. basically and so like, yeah, so the, the, the whole book sort of proceeds out of that like moment of freaking out from my point of view, sort of culminates in like, uh, thankfully, not ultimately serious cancer scare on my part. But so like, yeah, so I have I have sympathy with the, the not wanting to die part, but where I part company with transhumanists is like where they go with that, which is like, well, let's roll up our sleeves and use technology and like throw loads of money at the problem and actually try to become immortal because and this is like slightly paradoxical i suppose but as much as the idea of like my own personal death is deeply unappealing to me the idea of immortality is even more unappealing to me like i would not as much as i don't want to die i definitely do not want to continue living indefinitely and i think it definitely leads to some dystopian end point whereby I think like inherent in the whole transhuman project is to me anyway, an exacerbation of the kinds of already dystopian social inequalities that we're living under at the moment. Yeah. Uh, and so like inevitably, I think 
and I, I don't necessarily buy the idea that it would ever be possible to become immortal or even to like extend their lifespans like mm. radically beyond what they already are. I think the science is pretty murky there, and that's part of what I look at in the book. But I think if you take them at their word and you imagine the future that they are projecting, to me, it seems like inevitable that the people that those technologies are going to benefit is not everyone. It's yeah. Peter Thiel and Elon Musk, basically, and the people who can, you know, afford the, you know, to upgrade themselves and to, you know, sort of radically expand their lifespans. And so you then have what seems to me to be, yeah, like a really dystopian scenario where not only do you have the, these like social inequalities that are already tearing society apart, but you also have an actual cognitive elite. You have like people who are enhancing themselves above the sort of normal human functioning level and who are living eternally. And like that's, that's not cool, I don't think. So yeah, it's really dystopian <laughs> from my point of view. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, well, um, thank you very much for your time. It's been good to talk to you. People can obviously find that article that we've been talking about on The Guardian. They can find To Be a Machine as well. I think I'm going to read that. It sounds very interesting. Uh, and yeah, yeah, thank you very much for talking to me. It's been good. Thanks a lot, Paul. So that's the end of my conversation with Mark. I hope you enjoyed it. Just to remind you of what I mentioned at the beginning, iTunes reviews would be good if you've got the time to do that. Patreon is patreon.com slash utopian horizons. Um, I recently set up a Discord, which is a kind of um, chat server for people who don't know. And there are a few people who listen to the podcast in there with me. So if you'd like to join and come and talk to us, you can find the link to the Discord. It's the pin tweet on my Twitter feed, which is at utopian horizons. So just go there and um, click the link at the uh, on the pin tweet and you can join the Discord and come and talk to me and other people. That would be cool. So yeah, as I mentioned, the tweet at Twitter is at Utopian Horizons. If you want to email me any um, questions or, or comments or feedback you've got, I'd love to hear that too. So you can get in touch with me on utopianhorizonspod at gmail.com. As I said at the beginning of the podcast, the interview for the next episode is already recorded. It is on Strange Days. After that, there should be an episode on Angel of the Revolution, which I have taken far too long to read, but have almost finished now. And then I'll probably go... Back to back to a Philip K. Dick episode, I think, but I'll see where I am after those are out. I am very tired, so I think I will leave that there. Thank you very much for listening, and I will be back soon with the new episode.